there's nothing to writing. You simply sit down at your typewriter, open up a vein and bleed your words onto a page. So says Ernest Hemingway. When I was in high school as an aspiring writer, I took that phrase, not literally, I took it metaphorically to heart and I took it to mean that great writers, great artists suffered for their art. I don't know why they're suffering, but they're just suffering for their art. In order to create great art, you needed to suffer and you needed to be sad. Sad means that people will take you seriously because sad has a lot of cultural capital in our society and the ways we think of what produces great art. That was my line of thinking as a teenager, the now older and hopefully a little wiser. I've changed my mind. My name is Teresa and this this is the tortured artist. The inspiration for this video came about because I came across a new term and it's called yearn posting. Yearn posting on TikTok. Yearn posting are shorts that are full of melancholy, full of wanting, full of ennui set to gloomy music. It's usually a gallery of sad quotes from classic authors and screen caps. Sylvia Plath, I love all the things that will destroy me in the end. Yearn posting also includes screen caps from movies from what is called the female rage school of cinema, which includes most notably Black Swan, which I've seen a lot on the internet as equated to Joker for girls, Possession, Gone Girl, Girl Interrupted. So a lot of movies in which the heroine suffers from mental illness. Having stumbled upon the concept of urine posting, I realized that urine posting is just basically this generation's version of sad girl Tumblr. So in the 2010s, when I was in my 20s, I was really into Tumblr. I posted some stuff and mostly I reblog things and I was really into the soft grunge sad girl tumblr. Sad girl tumblr for me was a lot of screen grabs from Sofia Coppola movies, French new wave movies from the 1997 Lolita, Lana Del Rey music videos and the screen grabs would have subtitles that say she was poetry in a world that was still learning the alphabet. Be young, be dope, be proud. When you stop doing things for fun you might as well be dead. Hemingway. Nyctophilia. Love of darkness or night. Finding relaxation or comfort in the darkness. And I remember I did quote a lot of Sylvia Plath. She was an American poet in the 1950s. She wrote one book called The Bell Jar and then she wrote a collection of poems, the most famous collection of poems being Ariel. This video is gonna touch a lot on the S word, which I can't say on YouTube. So I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to use this word. She unalived herself by putting her head in an oven after suffering from years of depression and mental illness. And she also got electric shock therapy, you know, her life was tumultuous and troubled. And at the end, she ended herself tragically. But after her death, her entire unabridged journals were published. And I've read snippets of that journal as any morose aspiring writer in her teen years would do. And one of the most famous quotes that is also circulated around sad girl Tumblr, and now I'm thinking urine posting TikTok, I love all the things that will destroy me in the end. And I thought in my youth, that was just the deepest things. I love all the things that will destroy me in the end. I'm not a huge Sylvia Plath fan, but I do very much love this one poem. My God, I am ill. I have taken a pill to kill. From a cut, a million soldiers run. Red coats, everyone. See, I love that poem so much I have it memorized. She was a great writer, great poet, but also a very disturbed person. And unfortunately, her suffering and her untimely death Death was romanticized in the myth of the tortured artist. So having stumbled upon the concept of urine posting and also discovering the renewed romanticization of the character of Nina Sawyer in Black Swan, which is also a suffering artist. She literally just bled for her art. And it made me wonder why, when it comes to artists, why do we glorify the myth of the tortured artist? So back then, 13 years old, I had an un unshakable belief in my talent as a writer. In actuality, I probably had a kernel of talent. Like my teachers told me I was a good writer. Everyone I came across told me I was a good writer. So I, I believed in myself. I thought, why not just aim for the stars? And I wanted to be a literary novelist. I read my share of romance novels at the time, but it never occurred to me to become a romance novelist because it's kind of ingrained in you that nobody respects romance writers, even though now I know that romance writers are the bread and butter of the publishing industry. 90% of books sold and published are romance novels. 
I didn't want to be a horror writer. Basically, I didn't want to be a genre writer. I wanted to be a pretentious literary writer who will win the Pulitzer Prize. Basically, I wanted to be invited into those prestigious New York City book readings where I would read from my collection of short stories for some reason. I have a collection of short stories and my literary masterpiece, like my magnum opus. Like I wanted to be like F. Scott Fitzgerald. I wanted to be like Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath, Ernest Hemingway. So even though I read genre fiction and I also read a bunch of trashy novels, I was really into V.C. Andrews, soap opera-esque gothic fiction. So I read all of that, but I didn't aspire to write like that. I wanted to be invited to a book reading where I will stand there and read my book and then people will clap at the end you know that scene from Capote where Truman Capote is reading the first paragraph or the first chapter of In Cold Blood, his magnum opus? There's a lot of weight and a lot of gravitas that comes with such book readings. You know, there would be literary critics. Bravo, bravo. And then I would just kind of bask in all the adoration and my ego will just grow and grow. And that's basically what I wanted in middle school. So we were assigned a bunch of classic literature in high school. I read a bunch of classic literature myself. And one thing that all these books have in common, other than being very Western focused, they were all very solemn and very sad. Crime and Punishment, very sad. The Bell Jar, very sad. The Great Gatsby, the Disillusion of the American Dream. The Scarlet Letter, I don't think things ended well for any of the characters there. A Tale of Two Cities ended with the main character at the guillotine. Very solemn, weighty, weighty issues. Never in the League of Assigned Reading back then were you ever assigned anything that was a romance or a comedy. You're never assigned to read anything that makes you escape or feel good. In fact, the novels you're assigned to read, they don't want you to escape. You don't escape. You face the societal issues of the time. Somehow it's ingrained when it comes to art, weighty things things, solemn things, sad things, have more cultural capital. So I think everyone can agree that most of classic literature dealt with weighty issues. If there was a little bit of comedy in them, they were few and far between. Never ever ever has one entire book been completely lighthearted or funny. I'm sure those books existed, but they are, you know, for the masses. They're for popular consumption. They're dime store novels. They're, ooh, even worse, they're novels to entertain women, brooding artistic material material with a lot of gravitas, with a lot of ennui. That kind of art is considered important versus something lighthearted and funny, kind of like a romp. That's considered fluff, not important. So therefore, somehow I got it in my mind that in order to be taken seriously as, a, as an author or taken seriously as an artist, one has to be sad. Sad is romanticized. Sad is lauded. The torture artist is put on a pedestal. And sad means that you have something to say, that your suffering somehow manifests itself into tragically beautiful art that the world can enjoy. So that was my mindset as a teenager. It was kind of a toxic mindset. And at the same time, I don't think it's anything new. I think like a lot of teenagers go through like a brooding, emo, angst-filled phase. I myself, I journaled a lot as a teen. I didn't do it online, thank God. <laughs> Dear diary, I don't know how I can go on any longer. I feel the weight of the world of on my shoulders. I do not know how I am going to survive in the howling wilderness. Dear diary, the darkness, which is my constant companion, can howl no more. When I look back at high school, I spent most of my freshman, sophomore, and junior year in the depths of despair. That's what I can call it, the depths of despair. I don't think I was actually clinically depressed. I think I just got it in my head. Anything worth writing has to be written from this brooding, depressive state. So even though nobody read my journal, I wouldn't allow anybody to read my journals. I felt like I was performing despair. Even if I was feeling happy that day, I wouldn't allow myself to write anything happy. And it really took years of retraining myself, retraining my thought process and asking why do I feel this way? I'm finally able to say, I just want to write what I like to read, which is light fluffy romances with a little bit of sadness. Why do we equate somebody who is depressed and sad as someone who is deep? When you really think about it, when you really break it down. Somebody who is happy is no less deep than somebody who is sad. In fact, it takes much more courage to be happy. How many comedic movies do you see nominated for an Oscar? Actors who are acting, the cry acting and 
and the loud acting and the snot acting, but never a comedic role. Robin Williams only won his Oscar when he played a dramatic role in Good Will Hunting. Jim Carrey had his comedy movies, but then when he became a more serious actor, that's when he started getting Oscar nominations. Sad music, ballads, breakup songs, they're lauded over pop. The term bubblegum pop is met with derision. I know some people who are very judgy, by the way, and if I told them I like pop, maybe they wouldn't say it's my face, but they would think I'm an airhead. But also, I feel like sharing your playlist or back in my high school days, making a burn CD mixtape, that is like where you show that you have weighty things on your mind. You would never really admit that you like bubblegum pop. People judge you. They would think you're not a person of substance. So therefore you have to add in slow songs, sad songs, songs with hard hitting lyrics. Do you think it's harder to write a sad song than it is to write a happy song? I would say it's actually the same amount of effort, but we equate somebody who writes a sad song with, wow, they've suffered so much and now we're hearing it. The sad song is their reward from suffering versus if you were to write something like mbop, what did you suffer? What did mbop mean? So now the question begs to be asked, where do we get this idea of the tortured artist and how do we end up putting this tortured artist on a pedestal? Prior to the 19th century romantic movement, artists created their art as a job. They were commissioned by their patrons by the church. Michelangelo was commissioned by the church to do the Sistine Chapel. Shakespeare was commissioned by Queen Elizabeth to write plays. If they were working artists, they were paid to do a job, kind of like they were working on Upwork. They were commissioned to score an opera, write a poem, paint a fresco in the Sistine Chapel. Then came the romantic movement of the 19th century, and with it, artists turned from pleasing the world to indulging themselves. They rebelled against convention, proclaimed their uniqueness, savored their own melancholy. Many also chose a bohemian lifestyle to exhibit their otherness. You know that opera La Boheme, bunch of starving artists living in Paris, somebody dying of tuberculosis is inspiration behind Moulin Rouge, also the inspiration behind rent. The concept of tuberculosis chic was in vogue at the time. Looking like you had tuberculosis, looking like you're on the brink of death was considered romantic for some reason. One iconic image of the early romantic era is Victor Emile Janssen's 1828 self-portrait at the easel. Janssen, a handsome 21 year old artist is shown stripped to his waist as if for no other purpose than to display his puny chest being consumed by the bone disease that would later kill him. Byron, Shelley, and Keats, 19th century romantic poets, albeit they didn't perish by unaliving themselves, all died very young. By dying young, living fast and dying young, they were kind of immortalized and mythologized. And the whole concept of an artist dying young, dying at the peak of their talents, it's all furthered by the mythology of the 27 Club. So the 27 Club, Legion of Musicians, Mozart, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, all met their end at 27. And in many ways, they're kind of mythologized for dying at a young age. It's thought that their talent is a bright ball of fire, burning hot, burning fast, and burning out very soon, like a giant spark. There's this line that Shakespeare wrote in Romeo and Juliet, and that is later quoted to death in Twilight. These violent delights have violent ends. I see that 90% of these musicians are boomer musicians, and we know that the boomers lived fast, and they lived hard. Frankly, they're a reckless generation. I mean, like, most of them probably performed at Woodstock. Drugs were plentiful. In fact, I read that Jimi Hendrix he just did whatever drugs anybody handed him. Like he didn't even know what it was, he just took it. Mozart also party hard. I don't know if he did any drugs, I'm sure if there were drugs involved in 18th century Vienna that he would have partaken in it, but I'm told he, he liked the drink. Perhaps it was the drink that killed him. People in the past, it was easy for them to die. You have three bottles of Viennese brandy, you stumble around and then you fall into a snowy ditch and then you're sleeping outside during a blizzard. You're gonna catch them pneumonia and then perish. And we've heard tales of a lot of musicians that you would think based on the success of their song, their album, maybe their one hit wonders, you would think that they're rolling in dough, but in actuality, they probably signed a shady contract when they were just up and coming. And then even though they're successful, they're not seeing money in return. Like all the money goes to the record studio or all the money goes to their agents. They completely got scammed because they were young and naive and just trying to make it in the world. And I'm thinking that's what happened to Mozart. Like he was 
just celebrated his time, but I'm pretty sure he probably signed some shady contract, but he wasn't as well off as you think he would be because he just didn't know how to manage his money. And of course you would be depressed. And of course you would fall into depression and dark thoughts of despair when your basic human needs are not being taken care of. You're like trying to pay your bills. It's like the repo man's trying to take away your carriage or your car or whatever. And you're living in this drafty hovel in the middle of winter. You like not feeding yourself because you have no food because you have no money to buy food. How are you going to write the next great American novel, write the next great Viennese opera when you're about to be evicted from your apartment, you're about to live on the street. So in many respects, I think that's what happened to Vincent Van Gogh, the quintessential tortured artist. I read up on Mr. Van Gogh. He lived a troubled life. He was a suffering artist, a starving artist. He was never wealthy in his time, spent most of his money on artistic supplies, which is understandable because art supplies are expensive, even probably back then. We all know that he went through it and then he cut off his ear. He also ate some yellow paint. He was overwhelmed by voices in his head, probably had schizophrenia, and then he took a razor to his ear. He bandaged his wound and sent the ear to a woman in a brothel he and his friend often went to. Yeah. Like this guy, he needed help. When he was admitted to an asylum, he launched himself back into his work, making over 150 pieces during his one year stay at the asylum, many of which later became famous artworks. He was given an extra room that he used as a studio, and he often painted the institution's garden on days he felt better. So it was at this asylum that he created what many believe to be his magnum opus, The Starry Night. You know, when he was going through it and cut off his ear, he was an artist that was kind of borderline line broke and destitute. He wasn't eating. He wasn't taking care of himself. Whatever internal mental problems he was going through is not helped by the fact that he has like no nutrition and maybe no shelter. Then when he was assigned into an asylum, given a one year stay and all his basic needs are met, he has a roof over his head, people bring him food. That was when he painted Starry Night. There's this entire mythology completely unfounded that it was the art, it was his painting that cured him of his mental illness and that's what allowed him to go on this manic episode of creativity. But I'm thinking it's because his basic human needs were met. He got shelter, he got food, he had some place warm to stay. He could just focus on his artwork. I would venture to say that we romanticize the tortured artist because a lot of us want to believe that suffering gives us meaning and it makes us a good person. It goes back to the Bible, the suffering of Job. It was for something, right? Jesus. He's what you think about when you think about suffering. He suffered even more than Van Gogh. Art is a reflection of human Humanity. Art is a reflection of humanity and humanity's greatest virtue is overcoming adversity. So your suffering means that you're, um, you're a substantial person, a person of substance. So if you're able to go through like a period of hardcore, really good suffering and you're able to make it out of it, then you've triumphed. It's a win. But if you don't make it out of it, maybe you're a martyr. I think it's from the Bible that suffering means that you're a good person. So if you don't suffer, if you're like a hedonist, having the time of your life, then that means maybe you're not that good of a person. I touched off on this in my vampire video when I'm talking about interview with a vampire and how Louis spent many centuries just suffering, feeling bad about being a vampire, about feeding off humanity. And then Lestat, he was living deliciously. He was loving being a vampire. And he was portrayed kind of as a hedonist, like not having the conscience to suffer. Ultimately, the link between creative genius and personal adversity boils down to the idea that suffering does not happen in vain. So Van Gogh may have suffered from anxiety, like addiction, debilitating seizures, maybe schizophrenia but his suffering gave him insight into a new art form, the post-impressionism art form. So it's kind of like we're saying he went through all that in his life and what came out of it was something good. It was a starry night. Maybe that piece of art would not have been created were it not for his suffering. The greatest pressure produces the brightest diamonds. We're gonna get deeper on this, like really super, more deep than I planned. What happens if this is just all hot air and you're just suffering in vain? In that sense, can't you just be happy? I would venture to say it takes equal effort, maybe even more effort and more intelligence to make somebody laugh than to make somebody cry. A lot of Oscar bait movies with the actors just crying, snotting all over the place, scream shouting. It doesn't really make me feel anything. I'm like, that's pretty good acting, but it doesn't shake me. But sometimes when I'm sad, I want to watch 
while you were sleeping. I wanna watch You've Got Mail. It takes much more effort to make a movie or a piece of art that cheers somebody up when they're feeling down. Why is it that serious, more solemn pieces are celebrated when comedies, cozy things, things that make you feel good, they're just considered fluff. In my ripe old age, I've gained some wisdom. I've come to the conclusion it takes more effort and more intelligence and more artistry to make somebody who is sad happy than to make somebody who is happy sad. Anybody can make you sad. You just doom scroll on your phone and all of a sudden you're sad. What kind of effort would it take to make you happy? Now that's the question. And in that respect, comedians are the unappreciated geniuses of our time. Why aren't they winning Oscars? So the tortured artists, it's a little overrated. Your suffering does not necessarily create great art. So why not just live deliciously? In hindsight, I look back at my teen years. I remember being very gloomy. It was a private performance of gloominess that I was giving to myself in order to prove to myself that I was a person of substance. I could have just gone through my teenage years. I could have cranked up the happiness meter just two notches. I would have had happier memories. I was unhappy for nothing.